ladies and gentlemen, dear professors, dear guests, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to hold this presentation. Professor Veres asked me to provide you with a kind of uh, historical background of the April laws and uh, to, to, to speak about the importance of the April laws of 1848 uh, in the Hungarian uh, constitutional history. And I can say, uh, I don't want to spoiler, but I can say that uh, even for the future, uh, for, for the present and for, for our future, for our uh, constitutional thinking. Uh, in the first part of the presentation. Uh, so firstly, I would like to uh, talk about the April laws in, in general. What are the April laws? Why are uh, the series of laws of acts of parliament called April laws? Of course, the Hungarian part of the audience is already aware of this, but maybe for our uh, foreign guests, uh, it, it is something new. Uh, the April laws, so I would like to highlight, I don't want to go into the details, so my slides are quite detailed and my study will also be quite uh, detailed. Uh, now I just would like to highlight the most important elements, uh, two uh, very important factors about the April laws. The first uh, factor is that uh, the, the Hungarian April laws are the result of a normal uh, way of legislation. So these are basically a series of laws, 31 uh, acts of parliament, properly uh, adopted, accepted and promulgated uh, by, by the Hungarian parliament and the king of Hungary. Uh, why are they called the April laws? Because the promulgation, uh, the, the sanction, the royal sanction and the promulgation of the laws happened on the 11th of April 1848. So the parliament, the bo both houses of the Hungarian parliament adopted these laws uh, in March, but we don't call them March laws because referring to the fact that these laws were, uh, were sanctioned by the king in a due process of uh, legislation. The second uh, uh, remark I would like to uh, tell you in the beginning that uh, we, we used to call the April laws as uh, the constitution of uh, 1848. But if we will, we will go through the April laws and we will see that none of uh, the April laws uh, is a constitutional charter. So the Hungarian uh, parliament chose to keep the Hungarian historical constitution and to change only those parts of the Hungarian constitution that were most relevant. Uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, the, the goals of, of this legislation. So I made a, 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 maybe an interesting comparison between Hungary and Sweden. Uh, maybe you know uh, that in Sweden there is no constitutional charter. They have fundamental laws, cardinal uh, constitutional laws, and one of the, 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 these uh, fundamental laws of Sweden is called Reieringsform in German, uh, Regierungsform, which means form of government. Uh, and very similarly, one of the Hungarian April laws can be considered as the Hungarian Regierungsform, Act Number 3 of uh, 1848, but it is not a constitution, not a new constitutional charter, so it's very important to, to underline that the Hungarian historical constitution remained uh, to be uh, in force. Uh, in, in 1847. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, about uh, the historical background of the Diet of uh, 1847 and 48. Hungary had a special uh, role, a special place, a special position within the Habsburg Empire. Maybe not a unique position, because I read something about Belgium. Uh, something about uh, some other, uh, maybe also Bohemia be, uh, before the uh, Fernoyetel and Desordnung, that uh, Hungary, similarly to these other countries, was a country. 
Uh, maybe it's uh, too strong what I will say now, uh, but in my opinion, Hungary was a Reich and not a land. So when I read in, in, in uh, foreign publications, first of all German publications, that the Hungarian Landtag made this and that, uh, I, I always feel discomfortable. So uh, the Hungarian parliament was a Reichstag because no other uh, parliament had uh, uh, a jurisdiction over the Hungarian parliament on one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire uh, was not a monarch in Hungary in itself, uh, deriving from this position. Uh, he was a king of Hungary because he was crowned uh, with the Hungarian holy crown, and from that moment on, he became and, and continued to be uh, the monarch of, of the Kingdom of Hungary and all, the, all his uh, decrees uh, and, and patents uh, could not be valid uh, without the consent of, of the Hungarian estates. So this is the constitutional background and historic, uh, historical background of the April laws that Hungary had to be governed uh, in accordance, in line with its own constitutional rules. Uh, I just uh, listed some examples. Oh, sorry. Yes. So there were several attempts, at least three, but after 1848, uh, uh, even a fourth one, when the monarch wanted to govern Hungary as an emperor, uh, with autocratic or absolutistic means of government, but all these attempts failed. And at the end of the day, at the end of a decade or some years more, the Hungarian historical constitution had to be reinstated. We can see it happened at the end of the 17th century, uh, at the end of the, the failure of the absolutist, uh, enlightened uh, despotism of, of Joseph II and also after uh, uh, some uh, years more than one decade of absolutistic government of Francis I. So uh, what, I have, I, what I have to uh, draw as a conclusion that uh, the 1848 April laws were not a revolutionary e event. It, it was, all this happened in line with the rules of the normal way of, uh, of, of legislation in Hungary. Why was the, uh, the Diet of uh, 1847 convened? Not because of any revolution. It was convened in 1847. We haven't heard about any revolution uh, at that time in Europe. In 1947, uh, uh, the Hungarian Diet had to be convened because of two reasons. One of the reasons was that Archduke Joseph of Habsburg, who was then, or, or had been before, uh, the Palatine of Hungary, the most important, highest dignitary uh, of the Hungarian state, died. And when a Palatine dies, the Diet has to be convened because the estates have to elect a new palatine. It, was a, it had been a, a constitutional rule of Hungary since ages. Uh, a second uh, important uh, factor was that already almost three years passed uh, after the last parliament. And when three years passed, the king was uh, obliged to uh, convene the Hungarian Diet. So in 1847, the Hungarian Diet was convened by uh, Ferdinand V, not Ferdinand I, because as the King of Hungary, he was Ferdinand V. It doesn't matter uh, how, how many Ferdinands were in Austria. In Hungary, uh, it is a normal way of numbering. We continued from Ferdinand IV. There is no new empire in Hungary. So Ferdinand V uh, convened the Diet because of some normal constitutional uh, rules to be respected. Uh, it, it, it all began as a normal reform diet. You have to know, the Hungarians already know, that uh, since uh, 1825, uh, the Hungarian diet 
had already uh, started with uh, important uh, reforms, legal reforms, social reforms, economic, commercial reforms. So the Hungarian uh, society and Hungarian economy, the Hungarian private law, had already uh, uh, began to be changed uh, during these uh, reform diets. So in my opinion, uh, without the European Revolution of 1848, the Hungarian Diet of 47-48 uh, would have been a normal, another, just another reform diet. And then uh, the, the revolution uh, broke out. And of course, uh, I have to uh, admit <laughs> that it had an uh, important effect to, uh, uh, to the situation and, and how, how the things went on in, in Pressburg, in, in, in Pozsony, in Bratislava, which was the, the place of the Hungarian uh, uh, diet of the ancien regime. Uh, the revolution outbroke in Sicily in January uh, 48, and then also in Paris. <laughs> and on the 1st of March, the news about the, the European revolutionary wave arrived to Pressburg, and Kossuth, was, who was the, the leader of the opposition, uh, was encouraged. So he, 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 he felt that this is something that, that can accelerate the re reform process in Hungary and held a very important speech uh, uh, before the, uh, the estates, the lower chamber, uh, the parliament, uh, the lower chamber of the Hungarian parliament, and he added two very important elements to the original legislative uh, program. So besides the, the social uh, reforms, uh, he also mentioned that the form of government should uh, be changed to a parliamentary government, which meant uh, the, the accountability or responsibility of the, of the government should be uh, accepted as a principle. And he also mentioned the, uh, the change of the representation of the Hungary. With these two things had already been discussed several times in the parliament as well and in the political discussions as well, but were not on the agenda normally of, of this, uh, this diet yet. Uh, my opinion is that one year later or two years later, it would have happened even without uh, any uh, revolution uh, in Europe. They were already uh, being discussed. But uh, yes, in that, in that point, in that moment, it, uh, it uh, seemed quite uh, revolutionary. And as far as I know, uh, Kossuth's speech had if effect uh, to the events in Vienna as well. So it was a very important speech. I don't want to uh, underestimate it. After this, uh, some revolutionary events happened uh, here in Pest as well, close to this place. Uh, and these revolutionary events also encouraged the legislative process uh, in, the, in the Diet, and at the end of these uh, peaceful, almost cordial uh, Hungarian revolution, uh, the Danish historian Knud Jespersen uh, told this about the revolutionary events in Copenhagen in March uh, 1848, but the same things happened. Almost on the same day, a, rep a representative government was uh, appointed by the Danish king when uh, a representative government was appointed by the Hungarian king. It's very, very interesting that uh, how parallelly these things uh, happened in Copenhagen and Budapest without knowing about each other. So this is the, uh, the ghost of the time. So uh, it was a peaceful, almost cordial uh, revolution, and as the result of these uh, demonstrations, uh, the legislative process accelerated uh, in Pressburg. The April laws were adopted uh, in the second part of March, and finally, uh, on the 7th of April, the king accepted uh, the bills, and on the 11th of April, uh, the bills uh, were officially, officially promulgated as uh, acts of the Hungarian parliament. This is all what happened. 
So the process, the legislative process, was uh, supplemented with revolutionary elements of constitutional changes, and in general, the process was accelerated, and within two, three weeks, uh, all the laws uh, were finally adopted. Uh, and now, uh, in the second part of the presentation, let's see the three most important acts of uh, the Parliament uh, from the point of view of the constitutional uh, governmental system. Of course, the civil liberties, uh, the changes of the, of the social uh, relationships are also very important, but I, unfortunately I don't have time to uh, talk about these. So just, let's, let's just focus on Acts uh, 3, 4 and 5 of uh, 1848. Uh, in the, in the top uh, right corner, you can see the, not a photo, but the face of Kalman Gitsi. He is basically the founding father in the sense of uh, the, the word, in the very sense of the word that he drafted. He wrote down uh, the acts. He, is quite, uh, he, has, he had quite the same role as uh, Gover uh, Governor Morris in the United States of America. He, he was not the inventor of the Constitution of the United States, but he was the one who wrote it down. I think it's a very important role to, to be a good lawyer and to draft good laws. So that's why I wanted to, to uh, remember to, to Kalman Gitsi. So uh, act uh, number three uh, uh, was when it is on the establishment of the responsible government. Act four, the Hungarian Riksdag Sordning, just to make an, another Swedish comparison, so about the Hungarian parliament. And Act 5 was the Hungarian Electoral Reform Act, very similar to the, to the English uh, Electoral Reform Act of 1832. All the other parts, uh, so not the, the cabinet and not the parliament, but all the other elements of the Hungarian uh, historical constitution remained unchanged. Even the upper chamber of the Hungarian parliament remained unchanged. The April laws did not reform the aristocratic House of Lords of the Hungarian parliament, only the lower chamber was transformed uh, into uh, popular rep representation. So you can see that we had already had, we had already had very important other cardinal constitutional laws which served well, and of course, the judiciary and the local government, uh, these were uh, uh, elements of the constitution that were already open to further discussion. Uh, in, in, in March uh, 1884, the cabinet and the parliament, these were the two uh, factors, the two institutions of the Hungarian constitution that uh, were considered as most relevant. Act number three of uh, 1848, uh, this is the new form of government of Hungary, that's what I called the, uh, the Hungarian Regierungsform or Regierungsform. Uh, similarly to Sweden, uh, 1809. Uh, it uh, basically uh, transformed the Hungarian form of government from, uh, an, uh, from one uh, contractual monarchy, one limited monarchy to another, from the estate kind of limited monarchy to a modern kind of limited monarchy. This uh, uh, latter is uh, usually called constitutional monarchy, but also the estate monarchy is a constitutional monarchy in the grammatical sense of the word, of course. Uh, act number three uh, is uh, basically a, not, not, a, not a literal translation, but the a theoretical uh, translation of the Belgian constitution. I made a, a comparison, a table of comparison. Uh, on the uh, left uh, column, you can see the constitution of Belgium of, of 1831. Uh, on the, uh, in, the, in the right column, the Hungarian, the English translation of the Hungarian, uh, act uh, number three of, 80, uh, of, of 48. And you can see that uh, the substance is, is the same. Uh, we uh, uh, got 
uh, a responsible uh, government on one hand, and, uh, and secondly, the king uh, could govern, uh, could uh, ex exercise the executive power via his uh, responsible ministers. So from that point uh, of, of history, from that moment on, all uh, acts, all, all decisions, resolutions, appointments of the Hungarian king were only valid uh, if uh, also countersigned by one of the ministers of the responsible government. The same system, uh, uh, as we know from, from the Belgian constitution, that's uh, one of uh, the laws. So this is the, Hungarian, the first Hungarian responsible ministerium, by the way, appointed uh, weeks before the promulgation of Act Number no. 3, the same thing happened uh, as in Copenhagen, that there was no constitutional basis yet, but the king felt that uh, he had to appoint uh, a responsible government because it's, it's something good. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, just go through the ministers and would like to highlight one of them, with this moustache, not, not, not with this moustache, without moustache and without beard. Uh, he is uh, Prince uh, Esterházy, Paul Anton, Prince Esterházy, who was appointed as uh, the so-called minister besides the King of Hungary. Uh, his position is, is, is quite strange because it refers to the fact that uh, the foreign affairs, at least, maybe also uh, the foreign aspects of the military were uh, uh, considered as, ro as royal prerogatives at that time. So uh, it is not a completely uh, independent uh, ministerium or, or, or government in the, in, in the sense, in the original sense of the word, because uh, the foreign affairs were uh, and continued to be. Uh, the prerogative of, of the king. That's why we had no foreign minister or minister of foreign affairs in this government, but I think that in that part of, of, of the uh, 19th century it was absolutely normal. If we look at the, the personal union of Sweden and Norway, the foreign affairs were uh, royal prerogatives of the, of the common king and, and Norway had no, uh, no own uh, foreign minister uh, Either. So this is what, what is a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit unique from, from the list of the ministers and I would like to refer to the fact that when in 1867 the Hungarian constitution was reinstated and the Austro-Hungarian monarchy was established, I think that it, is a, it was a logical decision that the foreign affairs uh, continued to be accepted. As, uh, as, as common issue or, or as a common uh, uh, part of, of the government because of the royal prerogative. So Act uh, uh, number no. 4 of uh, 80, uh, 1848 uh, was about the parliament. That's what I call the Riksdagsordning from the Swedish example. Uh, it, 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 maybe it is the, less, uh, the least important from this, from this series the, of three laws, but it is also very important because it, uh, 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 it prescribed, uh, it ordered that the parliament uh, would have to be convened annually, not triannually as before, but annually. So in every year, the Hungarian parliament has to have sessions. Why? Because the Hungarian parliament has to adopt the budget for the next year, and the yearly budget, the annual budget, will be the basis of the accountability of the Hungarian government. So without a, a, a budget adopted by uh, the parliament, the government is not allowed to uh, exercise the executive power. So this is a very important aspect, the annual uh, sessions of the parliament and in connection with this uh, the king was prohibited to dissolve the meeting of the parliament before the acceptance of the budget. So the king's prerogatives towards the parliament, towards the functioning of the parliament was, uh, was limited. 
in that sense. But very, it is very important to mention that, on the other hand, the king's prerogative to sanction the laws was not changed. So, according to uh, the Hungarian historical constitution, an act of parliament must be sanctioned by the king. Without royal sanction, it is on only a bill or a decision, a resolution of the parliament, but not an act, not a legal uh, act, a law. Uh, and this uh, was not changed at all. So even after uh, uh, 48, even after uh, uh, 1867, and even in the first part of or first decades of, uh, of the 20th century, the Hungarian king continued to have uh, an absolute veto over uh, the legislative uh, process or over the, uh, the bills of the parliament. So it is not a complete revolution, nothing, the king was not killed, we had no guillotine uh, functioning uh, in the streets of Pest. It was a, 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 a thorough reform, constitutional reform. And finally, the second most important after act number three, or the same importance, act number five of uh, 1848, you have to know that Hungary had uh, uh, two, a bicameral parliament uh, since uh, 1608, so the very beginning of the 17th uh, century, and it was basically unchanged uh, for, for two centuries, more for two and a half centuries, almost for two and a half centuries, and uh, already uh, at the beginning of the, of the 19th century, discussions uh, began about the representation of the people. Because this old diet had a lower chamber uh, representing the Hungarian nobility and towns and some other communities, but in most of, in, in most of, the, uh, of the numbers, of deputies or, 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 or representatives, it was the representative organ of the Hungarian nobility. And the major part of the Hungarian society, I don't know, 95%, was, as they said, excluded from the bulwarks of the Hungarian constitution. And the reform uh, political thinkers uh, were already uh, discussing about, negotiating about how this uh, should, should change. We knew that uh, these things uh, had already changed in, in England, which served as an important model for the Hungarian historical uh, constitution, and in the revolutionary wave of 1848, this uh, electoral law was also adopted. What happened? Nothing revolutionary, in my opinion. Uh, a very strict property uh, qualification was uh, accepted. The basis of the property qualification was called a quarter of a villain's plot. It doesn't uh, say anything to us now, so I uh, made a, uh, an investigation. So what, what, it, what it actually meant, it means if my uh, uh, researches are correct, or the result of my researches is correct, uh, 43,000 square meters of land. I don't have any land uh, in Hungary of that size, so, I, so this is a very, very strict property qualification. Luckily, as an intellectual, I would have been allowed to, to uh, uh, to be a member of the Hungarian parliament because there were several allowances, several exceptional rules, as you can see on the slide, but the center of the qualification for being a representative was this uh, property qualification. And finally, uh, I would like to show you a comparison between uh, or among different uh, European countries and my uh, Consequence is that uh, the Hungarian uh, electoral regulation was somewhere between uh, Belgium and England and the revolution, revolutionary countries, but it was far from a universal male suffrage because of this property qualification. So that, that's what I 
uh, wanted to uh, show you from these, uh, these acts. And as a conclusion, I uh, can tell you that uh, the April laws uh, had and still have very, very uh, great importance in the Hungarian constitutional history and also uh, in, in the Hungarian present uh, constitution or nowadays constitution because it was the, uh, the one, it was uh, the moment in the Hungarian constitutional history when the concept of the constitutional monarchy, which is the basis of all parliamentary modern governments in Europe uh, actually appeared in Hungary. Were the April laws a, laws a failure? Uh, this is my last, very last question in this presentation. Uh, yes, in, in very, very short term, they were a failure because of the counter, because of the counter revolution in Vienna and because we were forced to uh, uh, forced into a war of independence that we lost in, in 40, 49. But uh, in the longer term, uh, it was not a failure. The April Constitution served as the basis uh, of the Hungarian Constitution, I can say, until uh, 1949. So the, 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 first, uh, uh, the very first Hungarian constitutional charter, which was a Stalinist constitution. So for 100 years, the Hungarian historical constitution functioned, operated very well on the basis of the April laws. Thank you very much for the attention.